the former president of the Suzuki Association of Utah. She was the uh, former artistic director and faculty for the Intermountain Suzuki String Institute, which is the largest uh, Suzuki String Institute in the United States, I believe. Um, and she has presented at a number of workshops, conferences, conventions. She's a, a well-published author with the Suzuki Association of the Americas, and we're just so fortunate to have Stacy on our faculty ranks for nearly 10 years um, and staying involved on our faculty as a visiting guest artist. She gave a wonderful masterclass last night and is continuing her visit with a lecture um, today. So I hope that you enjoy this wonderful presentation by Stacy Smith. Hey, everybody. I'm so happy to meet you. And thanks, Justin, for that big, long introduction. I have been involved with Suzuki for a long time. Um, I started teacher training when my oldest daughter, who is now 20, almost 21, was three years old. And so Suzuki has been a huge part of my life. And so along with teaching, um, being a Suzuki parent as well. And I'm going to talk a lot about those things, but I love, love, love talking to Suzuki parents because I'm in this. I'm in this with you. I'm doing it with you every day. And I can't say that I found all of the answers. But I want to talk to parents and to see how can I help make this journey maybe a little bit more fun or a little bit more interesting or even just a little bit more manageable. So I'm really grateful to be able to talk with you today. I'm going to share my screen mostly because I have some funny pictures to go along with my presentation today. So I want you to be able to maybe see a little bit more of what my life is like. So I've titled this talk Practical Practicing because of the idea that practicing, we, we do it every day. And it's easy to have an ideal in front of us. It's easy to have, hang on just a second. It's easy to have an ideal in front of us. It's easy to have this idea of there's one right way to do practicing. And it's easy to think, okay, everybody else has this going really, really well. And we are the only ones that struggle or we are the only ones that it doesn't work for, or we're the only ones that aren't, that don't yet have this in a rhythm. And so what I have found over my, my years and years of doing this are some techniques and some ways to help make this just, hopefully just a little bit easier. So let me share my screen with you and we are going to get going. I am gonna leave some time later on for questions or for comments, or if you have anything that you want to contribute to the conversation, I'm really, really happy to do that. You can just kind of unmute yourselves and jump on in. I thought before we start that I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on who I am and what my experiences are. And Justin already gave an introduction. I have lived in Utah most of my life and grew up there. And I'm now teaching at a fabulous Suzuki program outside of Fort Worth, Texas, where I get to teach violin, viola, cello, and sometimes even bass students. And I've spent a lot of time in Utah working with the Gifted Music School and the Suzuki Association of Utah and the Intermountain Suzuki String Institute that happens in Salt Lake every summer. I love teaching the violin, the viola, the cello. There is nothing like the magic smile on a child or a parent's face the first time that child plays a twinkle or learns vibrato or performs the Bach double for the first time. I love getting to know my students and their families. I love having the opportunity to travel to institutes and workshops across the country. I love working with students of all ages and backgrounds and ability levels. I'd like for you to take just a minute and think about why you started this musical journey with your child or with your children. What led you to Suzuki education? I didn't grow up as a Suzuki kid. Um, I didn't even start playing the violin until I was 12 years old. And I didn't take my first Suzuki teacher training course until well after I graduated from college and I started teaching and I had two little girls at home. In fact, I did my first unit of Suzuki teacher training and started my daughter on Suzuki violin lessons that same fall. So I started a Suzuki teacher and a Suzuki mom that same fall and it was a trip, <laughs> I tell you. But I started my kids playing instruments because I wanted my children to have some of the same musical experiences growing up that I did. 
creating friendships and making beautiful music and having the satisfaction of accomplishing something that once seemed impossible. And Suzuki violin lessons and later on viola, cello and bass lessons for my younger children seemed like a really great way to do that. Now, I'm a Suzuki mom to five kids. My youngest is seven. My oldest is, like I said, almost 21 and has graduated. And let me tell you that it is way, way harder to be the Suzuki mom than it is to be the teacher. Now, as a teacher in a lesson, and I have one of my student families here and they're going to laugh because they will relate to this. I can cheerfully say, now go home and work very carefully with your mom on this section and make sure you bring me back your 100 time start completed next week. And then the child smiles and nods happily and the mom smiles, smiles and nods happily and then they go home to do the hard work. I know very well with three kids in music lessons every week what it feels like to groan inwardly when the teacher assigns yet another 100 times chart. Or mutter under my breath when my kid is in a lesson and acts like he's never before seen a violin in his life. Or to watch that same son act utterly charming and agreeable in his lesson, all the while knowing that when practice time rolls around tomorrow, he's gonna to be about as charming and as agreeable as a rabid animal, even though I'm attempting to practice the exact same thing his teacher just assigned him. Does any of this sound familiar to any of you? I hope I'm not the only one. I love this graphic from violin teacher and author, Christine Goodner, she's a friend of mine. I don't know about you, but I've always had the secret fear that practicing goes perfectly well for every other parent and child except me. I assume a lot of the time that everyone else has joyful, peaceful practices, and I'm the only one whose kids spend as much time fighting and whining about practicing as they do actually practicing. And ever since I started as a brand new Suzuki parent 18 years ago, my goodness, 18 years, I've wondered if I read enough books and attended enough parent talks and took perfect notes at every lesson, somehow and somewhere, I would find the key to perfect practices every day with my own tribe of Suzuki musicians, right? For so, so many years, I was convinced that someone else held the answers for me and my children and my family. I would listen intently to more experienced teachers and parents and try to diligently implement all of their advice, even if the advice conflicted. <laughs> that was confusing. Since then, I've realized that there may be experts on the violin, there are experts on teaching, on parenting, there are experts on psychology, but I am the expert on my family and my children. So while I'm happy to share some things that have worked for me and my family, don't immediately take these as the ultimate Suzuki truth. They may not be the right answers for you and your children. The most important pieces of advice I have to give you are these. You are the expert in your family. You are the expert on your children. There are as many different ways to succeed in Suzuki music as there are Suzuki families. You are free as a parent to design and organize practice in a way that best fits you, your family, and your children. And most importantly, there is not just one correct way to do this. My youngest three children are all boys. I have a 13-year-old who plays the double bass and an 11 year old and a seven year old who both play the violin. We are very slowly creaking towards some practicing independence with my boys, but I am still practicing with all three of them daily. And I'm not going to lie, it's a lot. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of emotion on all of our parts. People ask me all the time how I do it or what my secret is. And the only the one thing that I always tell people, and some of you have heard me say this before, is that we just practice every day. One of my favorite Dr. Suzuki sayings is never hurry, never rest. And I think it applies here too. In my house, we practice every day, every day. And I found it is so, so much easier to practice every day even on the busy days, even the days when they are grumpy, even the days when I am grumpy, even the days when no one wants to, even on the days when I think, why am I doing this? I don't even like the violin. 
it is so sorry <laughs> real talk here it is so much easier to keep the habit of practicing going than to start and stop and start and stop and restart kids are super smart and i found that my kids especially could sense when there was a chink in my armor and if my kids knew that there was even the slightest chance that they're whining and they're fighting and they're resisting and they're rolling around on the floor saying, I don't want to practice, would cause me to back down and get them out of practicing for the day. They would then proceed to whine and fight and resist and roll around on the floor like it was their job. Once I made the decision that we were committed and we were going to make practicing a priority every day of the week, the fighting lessened. I'm telling you, I found that practicing every day is so much easier than practicing three or four days a week. I, now, I'm not going to say that my children ski happily to the practice room every day, but I will tell you there are many fewer fights about whether or not we are going to practice because they know that practicing is just something that we do. These pictures show Ian, my 11 year old violinist. And if you know him, you have to swear that you've never heard these stories that I'm going to tell you. Deal? Deal. Okay. He is super smart. He is a hard worker and he's becoming a good little violinist. He is also the one who fights me the most when it comes time to practice. Despite the fact that we practice every day, despite the fact that all of my children practice every day, Despite the fact that once he settles in and starts actually playing the violin, he enjoys it and he's focused and he works hard. Despite the fact that Ian really does like the violin, this kid used to throw a tantrum nearly every day when it was time to practice. And I'm talking the stomping feet, whining, grumpy, sometimes even crying and flopping on the floor kind of tantrums. All of my kids have gone through this stage sometimes multiple times where they insist I don't want to practice or I even get the dreaded but I hate practicing and as a parent there's sometimes where I just want to say are you new here. This isn't new, this isn't the first time that I've made you do this, it just kind of makes me giggle. But as a parent hearing I don't want to practice or I hate practicing can feel really scary. You can start wondering, am I, am I pushing something on a child because I want to, or am I doing something that really is good for my child? I spent a lot of years working at a music store and I saw a lot of rental instruments returned because parents said their kids didn't like to practice. I was always curious about that because as, as adults and children in society, there are sometimes we have to do things that we don't wanna do. I once had a parent pull a student out of lessons many years ago because she told me that her daughter, who was five years old, didn't come and ask her to practice every day. She expected her daughter to initiate the practice and was so dismayed when her daughter complained about practicing that she decided the violin obviously wasn't a good fit for her daughter. But here's where my really practical, matter of fact, Suzuki parentness comes out. And I'll tell my kids, do I let you just not brush your teeth or do your homework because you don't want to? Do we decide that because our child doesn't come to us with a toothbrush in their hands and beg to brush their teeth, that tooth brushing isn't a good fit for them? Or that because they don't like doing their homework that we shouldn't continue doing it? I'm being a little silly here and exaggerating the point, but the point is that kids don't like practicing all the time. This is a famous cellist, Pablo Casals, who at the age of 92 was asked why he continued to practice a cello three hours a day. And he answered, well, I'm beginning to notice some improvement. I'm going to be honest that with three kids to practice with and a full-time teaching position and all the other responsibilities that I have, I don't have a lot of extra time. I tend to be pretty no nonsense with my kids when it comes to practicing, which is one of the reasons I titled this talk Practical Practicing. I don't have time for a lot of intricate games or reward and incentive systems when it comes to practicing. Now, if these work for you, I think that's amazing. Keep doing it. But I'm going to be honest and tell you that when a kid tells me they hate practicing, my response is usually just an unemotional, okay. That always blows their mind. It stops them right in their tracks. 
because these kids are waiting for me to get upset or to try and persuade them that they don't really hate practicing or give them all the reasons that they should practice or talk them out of these big feelings that they're having. And usually I just shrug my shoulders and I say, okay, it's okay to not like practicing. Sometimes even famous musicians don't like to practice. Sometimes I will list off the things that they do like about playing their instruments. I remind them about the lesson coming up with their teacher and the fun we had at Summer Institute and how much they like their music friends and concerts. Sometimes I remind them that once the practicing is over, they'll be free to do something more fun. Sometimes I will say something along the lines of, well, let's see what we can do to make whatever they're working on easier. But sometimes I just acknowledge that practicing can be isolating or boring or difficult or monotonous, or most importantly, sometimes practicing just interrupts the things that they'd rather be doing. And sometimes just acknowledging that is enough to get them to pick up the violin again. So here are some of my practical tips for making the practice routine a bit easier. First, as I said before, it's easier to keep going than to start and stop and restart again. Dr. Suzuki was famous for telling children that they should only practice on the days that you eat. And when I tell that to a new student, they laugh and they go, wait, but I eat every day. And then I nod and say, uh-huh, so you should practice every day. At the beginning of the pandemic, a violin teacher friend of mine told her students that they should only practice on the days they want to use toilet paper. Second, connecting your practice time with a natural transition something that happens every day can also make things a little bit easier. If you practice every day after breakfast, for example, it becomes part of the routine and it's easy to finish breakfast and start what another teacher friend of mine calls violin breakfast. Back when life was normal <laughs> and my children were on a regular school schedule and things like that, I would practice with one child before school, one immediately after school and the third in the mornings right after his siblings left for school. And every year at the beginning of the school year, I find myself reevaluating when am I going to fit in practice with my kids and how am I going to make it work? If you're continuously thinking, oh, uh, we'll fit some practicing in somewhere today, it's very easy for the practicing to get squeezed out by everything else that's happening in your life. Third, make practice a priority by planning ahead. It's very, very easy for the doctor's appointments and the parent-teacher conferences and the soccer practices and things like that to interrupt the normal routine. But if you look at your schedule week by week and you look and think, okay, this is going to be a busy day, so maybe I need to shorten my practicing or maybe I need to do the practicing in a different way or in a different time or in a different place, those are some things that can make it successful even on the busy days. I got interviewed for a podcast a year or so ago, and the, um, the host of the podcast wanted me to discuss what it's like to practice with multiple children. And I confess that while practicing with more than one child every day has unique challenges, it doesn't matter if you're practicing with one child or seven children every day. There are going to be more days than not that are messy, where you and your child are both are frustrated, and where you wonder why you thought this was worth doing or were you convinced that if someone was to walk by your window and listen to you practice with your kid, they would think there was some form of torture going on. The truth is there will be times where you have beautiful moments practicing with your child. There will be those miraculous breakthroughs where you both wanna stand up and cheer. There will be times where you watch what your child has been able to achieve and the ways they've grown and developed and who they've become and you'll tear up and you'll be so grateful that you didn't quit. But there will probably be more moments that look much less than perfect. But my friends, what we're doing is so important and worthwhile that we need to embrace the times that it's less than perfect. Some of you might have seen this picture before. I think this is my all time favorite music mom picture and it makes me laugh every time that I see it. My oldest daughter, Abby, is the violist in this quartet and they were in the middle of some really grueling recording sessions when one of the parents snapped this picture. And it so perfectly describes how we all feel sometimes, doesn't it? What we're doing isn't easy. There's going to be days when you're frustrated and when your child is frustrated and when you're both out of patience. There'll be days when the phone rings 
and the baby cries and the dog escapes and the toddler covers himself in the sister's mascara and you're left feeling frazzled and all you manage to scratch out with your cellist is 10 minutes of a scale and half a review piece. It doesn't mean that you failed. One bad practicing day, week or month or more does not determine either your child's success or failure as a musician or your fitness as a parent. We all can be so ridiculously hard on ourselves. I saw this picture online a couple years ago and I referenced this a lot. I can't remember what this picture was originally referencing, but I haven't stopped thinking about it and how this picture relates to our kids and their growth as musicians. This is a Blackberry in all of its stages of development. There's no way to eliminate any of these developmental stages of the blackberry without destroying the fruit at the end. And no matter how much you wish it to be so, you can't bully a blackberry blossom into becoming a blackberry any sooner. You might be at the very beginning with a pre-twinkler. I remember texting a friend after nearly every lesson with Ian, who's now 11, telling her I was pretty certain the only thing we were ever, ever going to play in lessons was tuck a tuck a stop stop on the E string. I felt like weeks would go by and I wouldn't write down one new thing to practice because every lesson was still more than a year of lessons trying to perfect tuck a tuck a stop stop on the E string. I was also convinced that this particular child would be the first child to never learn vibrato despite my best efforts. It's easy to lose sight of where we're going when we're in the trenches, working on down bow and up bow, C sharp and C natural every day. But I will tell you, take the pictures and the videos because I'm blown away now. I think about the year and more that we spent agonizing over tucka tucka stop stop on the E string. And I now see him confidently tackling complicated pieces with determination and focus. And I'm grateful for every step that led us here. Just today, I came across my a time hop video with Ian, who was a curly headed five year old or six year old playing Minuet One from Book One. And I showed it to him and he said, oh, I was so little. I can't believe I was ever so little and played like that. And we both had a chance to smile and feel fortunate at how far he'd been able to come. I came across this on Instagram and I took a screenshot of it and have th thought of it ever since. It's a poem by a, an author named Morgan Harper Nichols, and she says, you've never shamed the waves for not arriving on the ocean shore any sooner than they were meant to. And you've never looked above you to guilt the cloud for taking her time as she crosses the noonday sky. You simply accept that she must travel at the pace she needs to. Oh, what a difference it would make if you gave yourself this same grace. You and your child are on this journey together. And we all know it's about so much more than music. It's about more than up bows and down bows, C sharps and C naturals. Remember too, that this is your child's journey and every child is different. Success will look different for every child. For some children, success means playing a major concerto on a con in a concert hall at the age of 12. And for some children, success might mean standing up in their first solo recital and playing winter time in Russia without falling apart on the stage. What your child will learn and gain from music study will be different than his or her siblings, your neighbors, your Suzuki friends, or other children in your studio or group class. Everyone is on their own journey. I do want to leave you today with some practical, easy to implement ideas that have been successful in my home, with my children, and in my studio. Like I said, I try to make things very easy and I don't do anything that requires a lot of time or elaborate preparation, but sometimes we all need to shake things up a little. This particular app is called Decide Now, and I can't remember if it's free or if it's 99 cents. Anyway, it's really easy to use and it's really easy to customize. And all three of my boys beg to use the spinner wheel to practice, even my 13 year old. This picture I took when my youngest was in book two, and I included all of the things that we practiced. His warm ups, his bow exercises, the vibrato, the shifting, the note reading, and all the book two pieces we were responsible for. And then during practice, he spins the wheel and it makes a really cool noise. And then whatever the wheel comes up on is what we practice next. 
And then the wheel lets you deactivate that space so it goes blank, black. You can see that some of those spaces are deactivated. And so it will only spin on the things that are still there. The randomness and the shuffling of the practice order makes it fun for the boys and it's really easy to use or customize. When I'm making a practice wheel, I confess that there's been times that if there's something that really needs some attention, I'll put it on the wheel two times or three times. I once made an entire wheel with just the Bach double. So measures 44 to 51, measures 51 to 55. When I was working through Bach double and it needed a lot of attention with one of my boys. The other thing that I like is I can keep the wheel from day to day. So if we don't finish everything on the wheel one day, we can just start spinning it where we left off the next day so that nothing gets forgotten or left out. Another idea, um, M&Ms, bead counters, something like that. This is brilliant around Halloween time. I go through their candy buckets and siphon off all of the individual packages of M&Ms or Skittles or anything that has a lot of different colored pieces in a bag. Then before practicing, I make a chart. Red might equal bow exercises, yellow would equal a scale, blue would equal review, orange would equal note reading, brown would equal he chooses, and green would equal I choose. And then the kid would start drawing out the M&Ms. Whatever the color they choose is what they practice next, and then they get to eat the M&M. This also works really well with sections of a gavotte or minuet, anything that you have that has a lot of sections. Each color can stand for the section or the line of what they need to practice next or which twinkle variation is next. And when the bag of M&Ms is gone, then practice is over. Pro tip number one, if you decide to implement M&Ms or Skittles practice, always include a mom's choice so that when they're choosing something over and over and over again, you can always steer the practice towards something that might not be getting focused on as much. Pro tip number two, open up the bag and look at how, what's in there. You all know that sometimes you get a bag of M&Ms with seven blues, a yellow, and two greens. And so then you look in the bag and you very quickly make the seven blues something they really need to focus on that day. Pro tip number three, M&Ms really work well for this. I try to steer away from Skittles and any kind of hard candy because it takes the kids forever to chew it up. And then, especially if you have a kid who tends towards stalling, you get, you know, for 45 minutes while you're waiting for them to chew the Skittle. My last pro tip about this is if you skim all of these candies off the top at Halloween and hide them somewhere, a pack of M&Ms a week will give you at least one happy practice every week between Halloween and Christmas. Also, sometimes when the practicing seems really stagnant at my house, I will just pick up a bag of mini, mini M&Ms, uh, the individual packages of M&Ms at the grocery store and just have them available for practice. Another idea for you is, and I can't take credit for this, it comes from my really good friend and teacher, Ed Sprunger. I've used this hundreds of times with students. I take 10 pennies or 10 chocolate chips or fruit snacks or little toys or beads on a bead counter. And five belong to the child and five belong to me or to a stuffed animal or a Lego guy or an action figure or something else in the room. And when you have a small section that they're drilling and it's something that you know they can do if they are focused on it, then you implement this and make sure the goal is really clear. If you play this measure and hear a C sharp, you win. And if I hear a C natural, I win. And if they meet the goal, they get to steal a penny from me or a bead from me. And if they don't, I get to steal the penny or the bead from them. And the first one to get the penny, all 10 pennies or all 10 beads wins. I used to play this with my kids against me, but I have one really sensitive kid who would want me to win, who would feel bad that I never got to win, not realizing I was that was the whole point. And then I had one kid that was a little bit more on the devious side and he started losing to me on purpose. But if we pick a stuffed animal or a bad guy action figure, can you tell I have all boys, then we can both root for whoever's practicing to be the winner. And this last one, Uno cards, I've gotten a ton of mileage out of. I even keep a handful of Uno cards in my violin case for reluctant students. If I can sense that this particular practice is going to be an uphill battle, I will often line up five to 10 Uno cards of varying numbers on the stand. 
then the child picks which card is next and the parent picks the activity. So if the child picks 12, it might be great to do 12 bow circles or 12 pinky taps. And a five would work for five repetitions of the tricky preview spot and the new piece. And two might be play two twinkle variations with your best posture. And then when the cards are gone, the practice is done. And last, I've had a lot of success, especially with my bigger boys, using timers. It helps keep me on track when we only have a limited amount of time. When I'm practicing with more than one of my boys in a row, it helps me not give all of the practice time to the first student. And I've also found some magic in setting a timer for a minute and telling a student or a child, I know this is difficult, but you can do anything for a minute. And then we stay completely focused and do as many repetitions as we can get in a minute and stop immediately when the timer goes off. This also works really well for my older boys as we work towards independence. I can set a timer for five minutes and say, review these five spots for five minutes until the timer goes off and then play through. And then I go and switch the laundry or work on the dinner or do, do something so they have a specific chore for a specific amount of time. Or say, I know you don't want to do scales. I know it's not your favorite. We're going to practice scales for seven minutes and then we're going to move on to something else. And it has changed practice with my older boys lately. They especially love when the timer goes off and we're in the middle of something and they get to stop immediately. The rule I've always made is if the timer goes off, we end, even if we're in the middle of a scale. And that always makes them giggle. I think that with children, practice must sometimes feel like it's never ending. And so having, you know, like, like, I'm just going to keep practicing until my mom decides it's good enough. And I just would rather be outside and I just have to practice forever. So there's something very concrete about having a timer in front of them. And they know exactly how much time is left before they're done. Here's a pro tip about timers. If your child starts fussing around and stalling and the timer is going, just stop the timer. You don't even have to say anything and don't start it again until they're practicing. I only had to do this once or twice before my boys figured out the practicing goes much faster if they stay focused. This works best if you talk very little and explain very little and you just control the timer. There's a recent social media trend started by the famous world violinist Hilary Hahn that gears towards 100 days of practice. So the idea is that she practices for 100 days in a row and she posts a short video on Instagram showing what they're practicing that day and it's really caught on and a lot of students are trying to do a consecutive 100 day streak of practice when my first daughter was young her teacher had plaques on the wall of her studio for all the students who had achieved 100 200 or more days in a row and outside my classroom at school we take pictures of the kids who have achieved practice streaks with a 100 day sign or a 200 day sign and display them year after year but I need to make a confession here and tell you that I've never, ever, ever in 17 plus years of Suzuki parenting had one of my children achieve 100 days of practicing in a row, nor have I ever pushed it on my students. I never thought with our busy lives that 100 days in a row was probable or practical or kind to make parents feel that kind of pressure until this year. You see, my seven-year-old who's seen in the slide practicing in the Darth Vader costume is pretty competitive. And when he saw that a few of his second grade friends had achieved 100 days of practice in a row and had their picture on the wall, he declared he wanted to practice 100 days in a row. Well, actually, he decided he wanted to beat the all-time school practice record, which currently stands at 600 days of practice in a row. But I told him we should start with 100 days. My friends, once my Charlie decides something, there's no stopping him. So 100 days of practice in a row it is. He roped his two brothers and his three cousins into it and somehow they all got the parents to agree to a huge 100 days party with whoever of the six kids achieved 100 days in a row. And we're currently about halfway there. Friends, never done this before and I have to tell you, I'm surprised in the best way possible at how the 100 day challenge has affected my three young musicians. Another quick story. When my youngest, Charlie, started playing the violin and I had three kids to practice with, I was overwhelmed. I could get two kids to practice with in a day, but I could never get three. And I was frustrated without, with not being able to make it work. And so I printed myself out a 100 days chart. And I gave myself a sticker 
on the 100 days chart for every day that I practice with all three of my children. And I didn't make myself like if I mess, missed a day, I didn't lose my streak or beat myself up. But there was something even as an adult, as a parent of five kids and a Suzuki teacher about giving myself a sticker for practicing with all three of my children. And then I reached 100 days and I treated myself to a massage. But there is something about a streak. My three boys are suddenly much more invested in making the practice happen because they have this big goal in their minds. And even on busy days or days when they don't want to, they realize that if they don't do it, they're going to break their streak. There's less moaning and groaning about the practicing and they started coming to me with solutions about how to make the practice happen on busy days. Mom, 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 it's Friday and I wanna go to my friend's house tonight. Can I please practice right after school so I can go to my friend's house and make sure my practicing is done? It's really cool. I'm not saying that every day is perfect. <laughs> Some days, like in this picture, we've had to get very creative about how we accomplish the practice. In this photo, my two older boys were at football practice and the youngest hadn't yet practiced and it was raining. So we ran the risk of practice being canceled or, you know, being ending early. So I grabbed the violin and I grabbed the boys and we practiced in the minivan while his brothers practiced football in the rain. Now, my friends, I fully recognize the level of crazy this represents and I own it, but it was different. And because it was different, it was actually surprisingly effective. And we all giggled when I played his accompaniment recordings at top volume on the car stereo for him to practice along with. My teacher friend Lucinda Alvey Landing taught me the phrase done is better than perfect when it comes to practice. Done is better than perfect. I love that because if I am depending on myself to have every practice be perfect, oh my goodness, it's never going to work. Done is better than perfect. I have seen amazing things come from our small streak that we have going of 50-ish days in a row, both in my kids' enthusiasm and how it's benefited their playing and progress to have their instruments in their hands every day. And here I am in Utah this week while my kids are on spring break and my kids have their 100 days charts with them while they're at their dad's and they are coloring them in and they're sending me videos of things that they're practicing and they're taking some accountability for it and some initiative on their very own. And what I initially thought would be impossible, you know, 17 years of, oh, I could never do 100 dates in a row, has turned into a huge benefit for all three of my little musicians. A few more ideas that might be helpful for you. First, trust your teacher. <laughs> trust their vision for your child. And trust that when they assign you to do something five times or 10 times or 25 times, that there's a really good reason for it and follow through on it. Watch how your teacher interacts with your child. Make note of the words they use and the things they emphasize and deem most important, and then follow through with those things in practice. A parent who contradicts the teacher in a lesson or at home, or practices something different at home than what was assigned in the lesson, confuses the child and interferes with the teacher and the child forming a close and trusting relationship. If you have concerns or questions about your teacher's approach, please reach out to them. Remember that you and your teacher are partners and you're both invested in your child and in your child's musical education. Second, be involved in your music community. I can't stress this enough. Practice for kids can feel long and tedious and isolating but having music friends who share the same interests and goals makes playing an instrument so much more fun. My closest friends are my music friends from all over the country and all over the world. And I've really seen this play out in my daughter's life. My oldest daughter is now in her third year attending the Colburn School, which is a small conservatory in Los Angeles, California. And to this day, I'm convinced that she would have quit playing the violin if she didn't have a network of close friends in her studio and in her performing groups. I asked her as an adult, um, what kept her playing the violin? Like, how did she get through it when things were hard? And she told me once, I really wanted to quit the violin, but I knew that if I quit my violin, I would have to quit my music friends and I wouldn't see them. If you don't already have a circle of music friends, ask your teacher if there's someone they recommend that's also in your studio that you could connect with. This picture that you see here is my son and some other friends. We frequently get together and have a multi-instrument, multi-age, multi-level group class. 
And there's something powerful in these kids playing with their friends and knowing that their friends are all working on the same things. Recently, they were all involved in a solo festival. And so on a Friday after school, we got together and all the kids played their solos for each other and then made comments and gave feedback to their friends. Now, this isn't this may not be something that always works for you, but it does help the kids know that other kids are doing the same things they are and that other adults in their life value music. And my friends, whatever you do, don't miss your group lessons with your kids. The opportunity for the kids for having fun while playing an instrument and socializing with the other kids is absolutely irreplaceable. Third, it's really easy to look at the things that you need to accomplish every day in a practice session and feel overwhelmed. I'm going to let you in on a little secret at my house. We almost never practice everything that's assigned in one practice session. It's just too much. I take a weekly view on practicing and I think of all of the things that we've been assigned and try and make sure everything on the list gets practiced maybe five times in seven days. And whatever we don't get to in one day goes to the top of the list for the next day. And I really try to resist the urge to mentally beat myself up for not checking all the boxes every day. Don't be afraid to do what works. Sometimes it might feel like you have to do cartwheels while your hair is on fire in order to get your child to do one more twinkle repetition. It might feel like the only way you can get practicing done for weeks on end is with bribes of fruit snacks. In fact, if you have gimmicks or games or things that you've worked for your children, you might want to take a second and drop them in the chat so that one of your, you know, so that some of us can hear it. This is a picture of Charlie's one eight size violin bow. And that, in fact, is the sticker of a pig's rear end. I was looking for a way to help him keep his fingers on the frog while he plays, and I grabbed a sheet of puffy stickers. I didn't even know that I had picture of a pig, a sticker of a pig butt. But because he's a six-year-old boy, and he immediately grabbed the sticker, I didn't even know it was on the sheet, and started giggling because there was a pig butt on his bow. And then, instead of me nagging him about fingers on the frog for the 80 millionth time, all I had to say was pig butt. And then they all started giggling. Once I had to name my child's third finger farty pants and the second finger boo boo butt while we were practicing to try and get him to pay attention to which finger he was putting down. Last week, my we were getting ready for the recital and there was a spot that kept my 11 year old. He was so frustrated. He was stomping his feet. And in a flash of inspiration, I said, lay down. And he said, what? And I made him lay down and practice that spot. And all of a sudden he was laughing again and it was goofy and that repetition it didn't sound good at all, but it was enough to break it up. I remember once practicing with my cellist and telling him I was going to send his Lego guys down the lava tube of death, which was really an empty wrapping paper tube for every incorrect repetition. And we were both laughing at the ridiculousness of it all. But you know what, at the end, at the end of that, we left happy. And we had shared that moment together where we were laughing and goofing off together and it strengthened our relationship as well as getting a successful practice in. My point here is, is there's no one right way to do this. If it works, hang on to it and go with it because it may not work tomorrow or next week. Don't be afraid to change things up if it isn't working. Don't be afraid to be silly or be loving or be flexible and give yourself and your student grace. Finally, one more thought from my friend Christine Goodner. The fact that your child practices on a random Tuesday in September is not important. Who they become because they practiced is. I've thought about this a lot. The process of practicing with our children is messy and real, and it's by far the hardest long-term thing I've ever done as a parent. I keep holding on to the idea that it doesn't have to be perfect in order to be worthwhile. This is about so, so much more than music. Dr. Suzuki said he was concerned with the development of noble hearts. Your child is growing and developing and what a wonderful opportunity we have to grow and develop with them through practicing. I really appreciate that you have spent time with me tonight talking and listening about practice. I'd love to open it up if people have questions or comments or things that they want to add. I hope that this was useful and gives you some ideas of things that you can take home and use in your practice relationship with your children.